Greetings and salutations and welcome back to our Europa Universalis 4 walkthrough or beginner tutorial as well we started as Delhi and now we are Hindustan. Now we're unifying the Indian subcontinent. Uh, we've been very successful at that. Things so far as to push into the Baluchistan region or some of the stuff is now at Pakistan in the present day and some of it is Persia or sorry Iran. Now Persia in the uh, 19th century and post what 1921-1922 they become uh, the dominant of Iran and we have Yarkand as a vassal so they are going to be integrated into our country and as soon as we're ready in terms of finances and manpower we're going to invade Hejaz and fight Hejaz in Oman over some Iraqi territory we'll probably also end up taking some stuff along this coast and force Oman to break their alliance with Ottomans. Their nobility is demanding more privileges, we could lose prestige or upset them and face further revolts. No, we'll lose prestige, we can get prestige easily. Now we're getting a decent number of sailors each month, 37. Uh, at first we didn't even have a coast and then we had one sea province, so we're getting like two sailors per month. Now we're, we're at least getting 37 as we have accumulated a large coastline. And if we wanted even more manpower, we could invest in this military idea, but I think we do want military tech 14. We can't really afford to fall far behind, and we're keeping pace with the Ottomans right now. And this would put us, put us, push us ahead of them if we hit military tech 14. Sorry, when I'm doing these videos, um, often I'm doing a lot of talking and do several of them at a time. And my throat will, and my mouth will get dry, and I'll just fumble with words. I really do know how to speak English. Trust my excuses. Okay, anyway, moving on. Uh, one thing that I forgot to do uh, before we invaded VJ the last time, I really should have set them as a rival when we had the opportunity to do so, because that would have made possible for us to get a lot of power projection. Now that we no longer have a truce with the Ottomans, I am going to issue an embargo on them. And the Ottomans are invading Mamluks right now, trying to build up their their power base. And that is unfortunate. We could get an alliance right now with Mongyang. We're already over by one, so I really wouldn't wait until we've integrated Balochistan into our country. And we can't safely support this many troops right here in Golconda, so I'm going to relocate some measure of them. We're allowed about 28,000 troops, so we're four over the limit. Let's move these four units. Costa, maybe? Yeah, Costa does not have rebels. Actually, not many of our provinces do. Goa and Asor. I don't know where Mandasor is. We'll have to look around for that one. Or we could just use our search function here. Am I making it up? Mansoor. Just making up some of the some of the letters to make it up. Okay, that's north further than I expected it to be. We'll suppress them fairly easily. And I think we've got enough troops in the south that we can basically avoid these rebellions. Let's 
taking a look at where we have revolts. So we're going to move these guys down to Vinod, state of Kerala, which is one of the really cool places in India. Actually, lived there. And at one point, I'm not Indian or of Indian descent, a white American. Uh, but I've lived several places in India. I've lived in Russia. I've, yeah, I've lived abroad and for various purposes while doing research or learning languages and doing other stuff. I'm an academic, I'm a historian. And Kerala is a place that. They produce some coffee and, and coconuts. It's got South Indian cuisine. And they don't drink as much tea there. It's a coffee producing place. And it's one of the better educated parts of India. I don't have any mechanics to discuss. I'm just going to you know, fill our time with some idle banter. And due to just the personalities of the Rajas that were there prior to subjugation to um, foreign rule, British rule. They were investing a lot in human capital, infrastructure, um, education. And then, due to its location, you can guess that that's one of the places that got a lot of foreign missionaries, and they focus on education. So it ended up being one of the best educated places before um, British rule, during British rule, and after British rule. And then the communist movement gained a lot of traction here. Two places, incidentally, that had relatively high numbers of Christians were Kerala, and I think um, this province as well had a respectable number of Christians. And then the Darjeeling region so up here is West Bengal. And it's also um, one of the places that lots of British missionaries went. It's where they started producing tea up in Darjeeling. And those places with high literacy um, became hotbeds of intellectualism. So during British rule, they became hotbeds of the communist movement, lots of Marxists there. So after independence, the state of Bengal and Kerala became the two communist states. The Bengal there. And Kerala there. It's really interesting. We'd like, you know, go to the beaches there in Kerala and there would be Soviet flags flying. If I showed people a picture of these beaches with Soviet flags flying, you know, in the 2000s, you know, 21st century, people would just, you know, assume it's like Cuba or something. But no, it's India. Anyway. We're building up these points. We're waiting on global trade. And the fact that you know, I went to two of the communist states, I also went to the capital here, has to do with the fact that I study Russian-Indian relations. So it wasn't just by coincidence that I ended up in places that have um, communist movements. It's that, you know, I'm trained as a scholar of the Soviet Union. That's what I write about. That's what I research. That's what I teach. But at the moment, I'm just writing. Okay, Goa remains um, very powerful economically. We need to extend some states over that area so that our merchants will be more effective in pushing trade up. And we also need to eliminate BJ so that we have more control over this region. Okay, so we could work on getting administrative technology. And once we reach level 12, we will have more states. 
but I'm interested in getting our administrative ideas unlocked here. Because as we get more ideas unlocked in this track, we will be unlocking more and more ideas. And I want that global trade power. I want the manpower. And once we get two more ideas, we will reduce the cost of our administrative technology by 10%. So it'll be faster for us to finish these ideas and then play catch up here than to play catch up here and then finish these ideas. And once we get this last idea, get two more here, we will unlock five more states anyway. And then we can put some state level administration down here. And every time we complete an administrative idea, our administrative technology becomes 2% cheaper. We can see ideas minus 10%. And the same thing applies to military. We have two military ideas completed in a quantity group. So our military technology is 4% cheaper. Obviously, quantity ideas are not going to improve the quality of our troops. So I do want to stay up to date as much as possible here on military technology. Okay, so the nation of Dali has had some dissidents are asking us for support. We could send some money to them and upset Dali, or we can just lose prestige. We'll lose prestige. We don't want to give our herder the money to upset some nation that we don't care about at all. Okay, military tech, increase it, and we get better cavalry. We can also now build better forts. And when we have the money, that's something we can consider. But for now, we're just going to upgrade our cavalry. We can build another trade ship, so let's do that. And those ships are being produced, and they'll automatically leave port and join up with our trade fleet. We've got two trade fleets at the moment. If they're ever at the same place at the same time, they will merge together. Tangu canceled that military access that they had through our country as they finished whatever war. Okay, do we want to collect some taxes from our clergy? They'll give us more money, but we'll lose piety and prestige. No, we want prestige and piety. Okay, let's just bring these two fleets together. And then tell them to protect trade once again. Now, in the current patch, there's a bug that you could set your troops to hunt pirates if there's pirates going around in your region, and they will also do the job of protecting trade. However, um, I don't need to do the... Uh, there actually are pirates operating around here. Are they taking any money out of our trade node? No, I think they're working west of there. Yeah, we can see that there's zero pirates hunting. But that will be fixed. It's fixed under the beta patch. So I don't want to do something like that that would encourage um, bad habits in the future as things are, are changed. We can get 10,000 more troops. So why don't we build uh, our army just a little bit. It's five of the 10,000. And the only places that we have rebels are Korchin and Goa. So why don't we move some more of these troops up north. This is all the same army. I've just split it in half because Goa doesn't have the infrastructure yet to support all of these troops.
Okay, our currency is not doing great. A lot of inflation, so do we increase autonomy? No. We use some of our hard-earned admin points to bring down that inflation. Once we get our inflation down beneath lower than uh, I think if it's five points or lower, we won't get those events any longer. And one of our guys, our advisors, his job is to reduce our inflation. So every year he will reduce it a little bit. We could ask our merchant guilds for more money. Let's do that. He'll be upset for a month. There's a weird bug. that The loyalty moves towards 10. Or sorry, moves towards 50 at the rate of 0.1 per month, but it doesn't seem to reach there. It just stops at 49.98, and I'm not sure exactly what rounding issues causes it to do that. Something causes it to do that. So you'll end up, if you do like I do, wait till you're just shy of 50, and then take money from your merchant guilds. You end up upsetting them for a month, and then they get over it. Okay, there's a triangle trade between Europe. Um, let's see, what's the triangle? So the triangle is between Europe, West Africa, and the New World. Moving cotton, tobacco, and sugar from the New World manufactured goods from Europe and slaves from West Africa. So it increases the price of slaves. And England is important in that trade. So they get some money and some prestige. Shame on you guys engaging in the slave trade. Shame on you. Slaves are actually only really useful to you if you have overseas colonies. So eventually we'll probably abolish slavery. Let's see how long. 17 minutes in. I want to check something on the back end. We'll be paused for a second here. I'm actually uploading some videos as we speak. Okay, it looks like everything's going there. Well, there, everything is going well with our recording. A Muscovy has conquered enough in the Russian region where they have formed the nation of Russia. Now, we can't get a royal marriage with them because we're in different religious groups. Christianity one of the features of the religion in this game is that they're only able to marry other Christians. Now you could have interreligious, interdenomination of marriages within the faith of Christianity. So for instance, if France is Catholic, they could marry the royal family of England who is Protestant. That's probably not something that's going to happen too often as France and England are, generally speaking, rivals. But perhaps the rulers of, of Bohemia, who is Protestant, and France, who are Protestant, might have a royal marriage. Or the Reform, the real-life Calvinists of Scotland, might marry into the royal family of France which is exactly what we see happening for marriage there. They're allies and married. Now, outside of Christianity, any religion could marry any other religion. But Christianity has some, has some reasons why they don't do that. Now, they get a consolation prize that they could get what they call personal unions. 
And I'll see if we can find any of those. Yes. Okay. So, we can see that Hungary is in a personal union under France. What this means is that the ruler of France, by virtue of royal marriages, has also become the ruler of Hungary. He's gained that title because there was a royal marriage here between their families and some noble, possibly the king himself of France, was married to somebody in Hungary. And when the Hungarian king died, the king of France or somebody, you know, maybe a son, we don't know exactly the details, somebody in France had the strongest claim to the throne of Hungary. So they became the king of Hungary as well. So only Christians can get that. There have been a few events from time to time that give non-Christians personal unions, but I don't know if any of those survive in the current incarnation of the game. There's some involving... You know, the Manchuria region, I believe. Um, possibly Korea had had them, or Ming had a chance of getting a personal union. But I don't think any of those exist any longer. And we've successfully suppressed all of those rebels down. We've got some cash. We could get 6,000 more troops. We've got three... Yeah, we need one more cavalry down here. We have 20,000 infantry. And eight cannons. We have five more troops. Why don't we get four more cannons? We could build up another army somewhere else if we wanted to. I think we'll leave it at that. It'll be one shy of our force limit. And we've got half of our manpower pool filled up. We're getting 1,400 men per month. That's really nice. And I think we're pretty much in a position where we could invade a Jaws. So let's get some armies ready for that task. We're going to grab these guys and march them up to Iraq, where we're going to launch our invasion Pegu being hostile towards us really that's surprising pretty bold of them let's increase our trust with Ayutthaya okay we've spotted a comet and it's caused our people to fear the end of times. We can declare it to be an omen, lose of stability, or blah, blah, blah. We went over this before. All of the events, cause us, all of the options, cause us to lose one stability. So we'll just pick one at random. Declare that comet to be Devil's Kith and Kin. And we're going to move our second army up here to Mogostan to prevent Oman's troops from crossing into Hormoz and into Baluchistan. We'll see some rebels start to organize, but at this point, they're not going to get anywhere. They'll never rise up. We could invade Timurids. Uh, they don't have a whole lot left. And they've lost most of their valuable territory. Don't have any allies, and I don't think we... Yeah, we don't have any claims on it, so we'd have to fabricate some claims. I guess we can pull the guy back from Yarkand to start working on that. Let's check to see if the Archant has any claims on people that we need to know, that we need to know about. They have claims on Chagatai. Ch 
Shagatai is allied with no guy. We'll probably get into a confrontation with them at some point if Russia tries to expand their power here. And I bet at some point Russia is going to bring us into a confrontation with the Ottomans over Crimea, who is an Ottoman ally. So we can expect that in the future, I think. Just a guess, but I'm pretty confident in that guess. Now, what can we expect from Oman? They are a naval power. They don't have, I don't think, too many troops. I can't see a large Hejazi force. We're going from large to small. Must have missed them somewhere. Okay, Oman has 23,000 troops. And he jaws. We could order this in alphabetical order to make it easier to find. Somehow I'm missing them. Perhaps I'm not very perceptive here. Yeah, we'll just do it in alphabetical order. Okay. That's why I'm not seeing them. They only have 6,000 men in their army. I don't know what's going on wrong with our country. We'll take a closer look. But first, let's get a troop, uh, a ship count. So, Hey Jaws has 12 ships total. None of them are big ships. Galleys are technically warships, but they're only really good in large numbers or in inland seas like here in the you know, Persian Gulf the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the North Sea and Baltic, etc. Oman is a naval power though. So they have six big ships. Yeah, we're, we're outmatched on the high seas. We'll have to tell our ships to go home in times of war or we could protect them with bringing together our two fleets. And that might be sufficient, but no guarantees. Okay, hey Jaws, how do you not have more than 6,000 troops? I don't see any massive rebellions, they're not at war. I don't know why they, they don't have a larger army. Let's go ahead and put this force in charge of that army. This uh, general in charge of this force. And there's never going to be a better time to evade Hey Jaws than right now, apparently. Maybe they just ended a big war. No, their truce is halfway up. We can see the truce timer. So we're going to declare a war. We're going to de declare it over Basra. So we're going to split our forces up. To capture all of this territory and move our forces down to grain. We failed our mission as we did not fill up our manpower to 90%. And let's go for Conquer Bulk. That'll give us a claim on the Adi or on uh, the Timurids, which is something we wanted anyway. And we have the chance. Oh, their fleet is attacking ours. Let's try to kill some of their ships with our war fleet. Okay, we sunk nine of their ships. Let's actually bring our fleet together, get it in port. And now send it out to protect trade once it's repaired. We crushed six of their ships and it looks like they've spread out their navy, so I think we'll we'll be safe. Their fleet is only dangerous to us when it's all brought together. And in fact, with them spread out, we could even prepare to engage these small, small concentrations of ships at a time. Defeat them, sink some of their ships, and we could start marching across these straits. 
Now, if they control the waterways here, we can't march across these straits. And we'll take the cheapo guy there and march all of these troops down to the nearest fort. Okay, let's engage this fleet over here as well. Well, it's just two ships. Kill them both. And pull into our subject's port to repair for a month. And go back out on those high seas. One of our ships is still a little damaged here. It's you know, what's our big warship, so we'll wait another month. And again, as they control the seas here, we can't live across those straits. We don't control the land on both sides. We can, since we control Hormuz at the moment and Mogostan, we could move back here. With them controlling one side and us controlling the other, if they control the straits, they block movement. But we are going to attack their ships here. Kill a few of them. We killed one of their big ships, so that was a big victory for us. And we are crossing the strait. We're going to break off, we're going to separate the repaired from the unrepaired and send these guys back into port to repair. Now this is sometimes dangerous trying to do a crossing unless you completely dominate navally. Because if they controlled these seas and defeated us here in battle, we might not be able to have anywhere to retreat to. But fortunately, we've been winning the naval naval confrontations due to their mismanagement of their naval war effort. And we're making good progress in sieging down these forts. Let's see how long this video has been going on. Uh, 32 minutes, I'm going to stop it here, and we'll continue the war in the next video.